From WAMU 88.5 at American University in Washington, welcome to the Kojo Namdi Show, connecting your neighborhood with the world. Should the District of Columbia raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour? That's the question local activists hope to ask voters next year. If they collect enough enough signatures for their ballot initiative and it passes, D.C. would join Seattle, San Francisco, and Los Angeles in boosting the pay for its lowest wage workers. The nationwide push to, to reach $15 an hour is raising new questions about what it would mean for cities, businesses, and workers. Studies are looking at whether higher minimum wages nudge businesses to move out but increase employee loyalty, and whether certain locations and companies handle the bump in pay better than others. Joining us to examine the evidence on minimum wage hikes is Martin Ostermule. He is a reporter and web producer here at WAMU 88.5. Hi, Martin. Hello. And joining us by phone is Norm Scheiber, reporter for the New York Times. Norm Scheiber, thank you for joining us. Sure, thanks for having me. Martin, if organizers collect enough signatures, next year's D.C. ballot will ask whether to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour by the end of the decade. What exactly would this measure do? So right now the the minimum wage in the districts is ten fifty an hour. By next year it'll be eleven fifty an hour. That's product of legislation that was passed a couple of years ago. But it would stop at eleven fifty an hour, and that's in coordination with Montgomery County and Prince George's County. So they're all raising their minimum wage together. Now activists in the district say, you know, eleven fifty is great, but it's just not enough. We were we were hoping to go up to twelve fifty before, but that didn't get passed by the council because that bill targeted just um, big box stores. So instead we're going to go all in. We're going for fifteen dollars, which is now part of a nationwide campaign. Um, and not only do they want, want to go to $15 an hour for most workers, they would also apply that to tipped workers. And now in the district, like many places, tipped workers actually make a lot less than the minimum, minimum wage and have to make it up, make up the difference in actual tips that they get on the job. So this would apply to all workers in the district by 2020 for non-tipped workers and 2024 for tipped workers. Let me ask our listeners how they feel about this. Should D.C. raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour? What do you say? Yes or no? And if so, why? 800-433-8850 is the number you can call with your question or comment. You can send email to kojo at wamu.org or send us a tweet at Kojo Show. Martin, who's promoting the $15 min- minimum wage here and who opposes it? So the two, there's two organizations that are behind it, one called Working Families and another called the Restaurant Opportunity Center. And they represent two different constituencies, but at the same time, they're kind of going towards the same goal. Now, the opposition is not surprisingly coming primarily from the business community. The Chamber of Commerce has complained loudly about it. Organizations representing contractors don't like the idea. Um, basically, anybody who owns a business and the, the, the trade organizations and lobbies that represent them have said that this is going to drive up costs for those businesses. It's going to push them into surrounding suburbs, especially into into parts of Maryland, which won't get the $15, and parts of Virginia, which don't which only follow the federal minimum wage, which is seven twenty-five. So they really worry that this is going to drive businesses out of the district. Noam Scheiber, you've looked at how raising the minimum wage has affected both employers and workers in other parts of the country. The tipping point seems to be how many people are affected when the minimum wage goes up. Can you explain the relationship between the median wage and the minimum wage? Sure. Yeah. So the median wage is basically what the worker um, exactly in the middle of the income spectrum makes. Um, And economists uh, measure the so-called bite of the minimum wage, uh, of a new minimum wage, by looking at um, the ratio of that wage to the median wage. So basically what the law requires you to pay the people at the bottom, uh, the ratio of that to the person right in the middle. And um, that ratio is is kind of uh, colloquially, colloquially referred to as the bite. And Historically, um, uh, economists feel pretty comfortable that if the bite is less than 50 percent, if the person at the very bottom makes about half what the person in the middle makes, um, most most areas can absorb that pretty well. Um, what we've seen recently with um, some of the cities that you've mentioned, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, um, Chicago raised its minimum wage to $13 an hour. Um, the wage board in New York City um, and in New York State actually raised, uh, raised the minimum wage for fast food workers to $15 an hour by 2018 in New York City and 2021 across the state. 
Um, we're now seeing that we're getting uh, outside of this traditional comfort zone of economists. We're, we're, we're up kind of in the high 50s, even the 60s uh, of that ratio of the minimum wage to the medium wage. And, you know, the truth is we just don't know. We don't have a ton of experience with uh, minimum wage that, that bites uh, at that much of the working population. Um, there are a couple of isolated examples. Um, Santa Fe in 2003 um, was probably the first contemporary, you know, uh, city to, to, to do that, uh, that significant an increase. And, it, and it, it's worked out pretty well there. Most studies have found that it, um, it has not had a, 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 a bad impact on employment. The one caveat there, though, is that um, small businesses, businesses under 25 employees were exempted. So it's not a perfect analogy. Um, and before that, you really have to go back to the late 1970s and early 1980s when the federal minimum wage um, in certain states with the low cost of living and lower wages effectively raised it very high given how low wages were in those states. So you had some southern states like Mississippi, South Carolina, North Carolina, and some unpopulated states like North and South Dakota. But we, you know, uh, we just haven't really studied those, um, those minimum wage increases with any kind of precision. Um, none of the modern tools that economists use, um, they just haven't gone back and looked at them. So we're, we're in a bit of a, a, you know, a sort of brave new world here. Um, we have the, the Santa Fe example. We have this sense that um, you know, around 50%, even 55%, we're probably okay. We just don't know when you get beyond that. We're talking here about the possibility of raising the minimum wage in the District of Columbia to $15 an hour, which will more likely than not be on the ballot next year. But Noam, do you know what the median wage in this area is right now? Yes, I'm glad you asked. I just I just looked at it. Um, so uh, the D.C. area is uh, probably the second highest um, median wage in the country outside of San Francisco and Silicon Valley. It's, it's very high. Um, it's depending on how you count the metro area. It's about $24 an hour. Um, if you look at San Francisco and Silicon Valley, it's like 25-ish. So we're 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 right up there <laughs> with uh, with any city in the country. Higher than New York, higher than L.A., higher than Seattle. Um, so if any place should be able to bear this, uh, D.C. should. I, I went and did an additional calculation. What that $15 would, you know, in 2020 would be worth today, and it's about 14 just over $14. So if you take that $14 and you take the $24, which is the median wage here, you get right up to about 58 59%, um, which suggests to me that D.C. will probably be able to absorb it reasonably well. Um, you know, on top of that, that's kind of the worst case scenario. If you have wage growth and not just inflation growth over the next, uh, you know, between now and 2020, that ratio will even fall a bit more. So D.C. actually is probably within the kind of, uh, historical comfort zone, maybe right at the edge of it, um, but the you know, but but that analysis suggests that DC should be able to should be able to withstand it without real real job losses. I'd like to share two points of view on that. One we got by way of a tweet from Jennifer, who says the district is actually losing its diversity because the city has become unaffordable for so many. And then there is this from Jim in Washington DC on the phone. Jim, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hey, Kojo. Uh, I just had a question. I'm not sure how it irons out, but um, if you raise the minimum wage, won't the employers or uh, product manufacturers just raise the cost of their products or services? You raise the minimum wage, the people who are affected by it, the businesses that are affected by it are simply going to raise their prices so it just becomes a wash and no more affordable for workers to live in than it was before. Is that what you're suggesting, Jim? Yes, thanks. Um, you know anything about that, Noam? Well, um, you know, it's certainly the case that employers do raise prices to offset the bite of a minimum wage. Uh, a couple things, though. I mean, uh, you know, that's not the only cost that a, a low-income uh, worker faces. Obviously, rent is probably the biggest cost, um, and it, it's hard to see how that would be directly affected by a rise in the minimum wage, though obviously as you raise prices, they can trickle into places where we don't always expect. Um, you know, the other thing is the, the price increases um, tend to not be um, – it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, and the reason is um, – Labor is only a small portion of uh, you know a company's overall costs. 
in a city like D.C. where real estate is very expensive. So, um, you know, if you run a McDonald's or a Subway here, um, your labor costs are probably not nothing. <laughs> you know, they're, they're significant. Um, but real estate is probably your bigger cost. And um, so, so less of the, the minimum wage hike flows through to your bottom line than it would be in an area where real estate is very cheap and your biggest cost is labor. Noam Scheiber, Scheiber is a reporter for the New York Times. He joins us by phone. We're talking about the impacts of raising the minimum wage with a proposal to raise the minimum wage in the District of Columbia to $15 that is likely to be on the ballot here next year. Martin Ostermuel joins us in studio. He is a reporter and web producer at WAMU. Martin, you mentioned the $7.25 minimum wage in Virginia, which is the equivalent of the federal minimum wage. What are the other minimum wages in D.C. and Maryland? Well, and that's the interesting thing. There's a lot of diversity. You've got Virginia on the low side at 725. You've got D.C. now at 1050, moving to 1150 next year, along with Montgomery and Prince George's County. But the rest of Maryland is not at that same level. They're going to move up to 1010. Right now, they're at 825. So you've got these kind of like staggered minimum wages across the region, which, you know, I... I think a lot of these business lobbies that oppose moving up to $15 were somewhat comfortable with when you had Prince George's, Montgomery, and D.C. all together because then they could say, well, you know, businesses, they're not going to flee because there's not many places to flee to necessarily. But once you start having, you know, half the majority of Maryland is at 1010, Montgomery County, Prince George's at 1150, D.C. potentially at 15, and Virginia at 725, I mean – that's that's a, a that's a lot of different minimum wages and a lot of different places for people to go if they don't like the jurisdiction they're currently in. Norm, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, as you pointed out, recently raised their minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour. Is there any data available yet on how that big a jump is affecting the economies in those places? Yeah, we really don't have um, a lot of systematic data yet, um, you know, mostly because the hikes just aren't in place. You know, a lot of these things don't happen till the late 20-teens, till 2020. Um, you know, I think San Francisco, I'm sorry, Santa Fe is probably our, our, our best uh, kind of semi-contemporary example of a wage hike that's this large. It was, um, it was kind of about a similar, similar magnitude. Um, um, you know, I, I think it, it is important to keep in mind um, this point that Martin raised that um, businesses certainly do say that, um, you know, uh, if the wage, uh, the minimum wage rises too high, they'll just move to a different jurisdiction with uh, with a lower minimum wage. I think, um, you know, it's certainly something people have to take seriously. I think there are reasons to think, though, that that threat is a bit overstated. Um, the first is that, you know, even though Virginia's minimum wage is 7.25 you know in a in a labor market that's tightening uh in an area with a very high median wage it's very unlikely that many people are actually making that 725 so um the differences are actually substantially smaller than you would expect just by comparing the minimum wage and the second thing is you know there's significant cost to be incurred um, if you if you pick up and move somewhere else, it's not that easy. Particularly if you're a you know you're a franchisee, you own three or four subways or three or four McDonald's. Um, it just you know uh, it would it would be a substantial expense for you to pick up and, and move elsewhere. Um, you know and the final thing is as I said. Um, the labor share, if you're in a place like D.C., um, while it is a significant expense, real estate is a higher expense. So um, the amount of this increase that actually flows through, through to your bottom line is, is, is much smaller than it would be in a, in a low-cost area. Um, and then, you know, the final thing I would say in, in D.C., I know I'm, I said the previous point was the last one, but um, we, what we've seen historically is that um, – uh, Areas with a lot of transient customers, um, you know, large tourist populations or a uh, big travel destination for business, uh, both of which D.C. is, um, they're able to pass along um, price increases, you know, relatively easily. Um, uh, you know, tourists are just going to eat at that McDonald's. They're going to eat at that Subway. They're not going to sweat, you know, another 50, per- uh, 50 cent cost, or another 25 cent cost. So all of those things suggest that, you know, I, I, I think the threat of moving is probably Probably a bit overstated. Martin, same question. Is there evidence that raising the minimum wage in one jurisdiction here drives businesses to move out, go someplace else with a lower minimum wage? And of course, the other side of that coin is if there's a higher minimum wage in nearby jurisdictions, workers from 
jurisdictions with lower minimum wages would be looking to go to those jurisdictions to make more money. Absolutely. So locally, I've, I think just about every reporter who covers this issue locally has been looking for that one great example of the business owner who's like, you know what, I can't stand DC's minimum wage, I'm hightailing it to Virginia. I'm sure some exist, but again, I feel, I feel like there's not probably not many of them. Even the folks at the Chamber of Commerce have said to me that, look, we don't like the idea of raising the minimum wage up to 11.50, which we're currently doing, but we recognize that at, at the worst we can say it's done is that maybe it's slowed a little growth in businesses, but they can't really say businesses have moved. And I think also you have to recognize that D.C. is the place to be. A lot of businesses want to be in the district. If this was 10 years ago, it would be a very different situation where the district was having trouble attracting both national retailers and developing its own local business. And now that's not as much of a problem. I mean, we have just about every national retailer wants to set up shop here. Small businesses can do very well. We have, you know, thriving bars and and, and restaurants and whatnot. And I can't imagine that because of an increase in the minimum wage, they would immediately say, you know what, like I'm heading over the river to Arlington because I can pay a lot less there. Because, again, it's questionable whether they'd be able to pay a whole lot less in Arlington, which is also an expensive jurisdiction. Let's hear how Don in Hanover, Maryland thinks it will affect him. Don, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hello, Joe Joe. Hello, Don. <laughs> <laughs> we are a, uh, a small business in uh, um, uh, between Fort, well, we're Fort Meade, Maryland, between Washington and D.C. And um, right now, our um, when we bring in a new employee, you know, we pay them ten dollars an hour because uh, we're a, a landscaping business. Um, right now, uh, our cost of of um, labor is about thirty five percent of what we take in for sales. And that's pretty significant. Now, also in my part of the country, um, real estate is also a huge expense that we have um, because real estate here is, is very expensive. But um, if we were to bring in, if the minimum wage was, was raised to $15 an hour, we'd probably be looking at around 50% for our uh, our total cost for the labor, because it's not only what we have to pay our employees, it's also the taxes that we have to pay on it. You know, we got the 6.2% FICA tax. We got the Medicare uh, tax that we also have to pay. And then on top of it all, we have to pay workman's compensation insurance, which is, you know, is workman's compensation insurance, as well as contribute to the Maryland um, Unemployment Fund. So all of these things are going to go up uh, exponentially. It's not just paying the employees. It's everything else that goes along with it. Now, I do understand how that can be a bit of a hardship for you, Don. But let me pose another question to you. How stable is your workforce, the people who work for you? uh, Well, right now we're using temporary um, employees uh, that we get from a temp agency. And I'll tell you why I raised that question, Norm. Do higher wages help businesses keep good workers? Yeah, no. All the a lot of the research suggests. I would say most of the research suggests that it, it does uh, substantially lower turnover. And um, the same research finds that turnover costs are actually um, pretty large. You know, they're, they 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 can be hidden um, because you never get a bill. <laughs> um, but the recruitment and training costs, um, you know, can be several thousand dollars a year on someone who's who's only making you know twenty to twenty five thousand dollars a year. So um, it can be upward of ten to twenty percent of the cost of that employee um, just to go out and find them and train them. So um, that is a, a significant way in which um, cities uh, or uh, firms in cities do offset the cost of these minimum wage increases. Don, thank you for your call. Good luck to you. We're running out of time very quickly, but I wanted to give Andrew Klein in Washington, D.C. a chance to make his point. If, Andrew, you make it as briefly as possible, you're yes, on the uh, air, Andrew. Thank you, Kojo. I'm with the Restaurant Association, yep. and th- this proposed initiative would triple uh, the labor costs for servers and bartenders for our D.C. restaurants. Uh, Those costs are not so easily absorbed. It's easy to say that you can raise prices, but the fact of the matter is people have a fixed amount of dollars to spend on dining out. Uh, Those people with prices are increased will dine out maybe nine times a month instead of ten times a month because the money just simply is not there. There's not unlimited funds for for people to dine out. The other issue is that uh, labor will be reduced. The owners will need to make up these costs in, in some way. And what they will do is they will reduce staff, which, of course, will reduce jobs. 
a reduced staff and make you make do everything by way of iPad. But um, Martin Ostermuel, the tipped workers mm -hmm. fifteen dollar would not kick in immediately. That 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 is phased in at a later date. It is phased that? in, and one of the arguments that people make in favor of it is that once you get that you d get rid of that ch the difference between tipped workers and non-tipped workers, it also means you go to a restaurant and in theory you no longer have to tip. So you might change the the economics. There's no longer that twenty percent additional you know, expense on top of the meal cost. So if you get rid of that, will you be more likely to take that additional meal a month? Maybe. What do you say, Noah? Yeah, there, there's no question. I mean, I think what we found generally with these minimum wage increases and uh, the particularly for tip workers is um, you do get um, some churn. Um, you know, different restaurants and different businesses with different business models are better or worse able to adapt. So um, when pe when economists say there's no job loss, they typically mean no net job loss. Sometimes, you know, you have businesses and uh, with, with a certain model dependent on low wage workers or tip workers, you know, they may well go out of business. But, um, you know, when you see no net loss, it means that you, you get new businesses whose model is able to adapt to it. As Martin said, you may well see businesses starting that, that just don't, um, let's say no tipping, and we're, we're just going to um, raise our prices 20%. And, um, you know, it, the, the service fee is going to be reflected in, in the cost of the meal. Um, and, that, and that could very well succeed. So I think um, it, it is important to concede to critics that it, it's not like this is um, completely frictionless and completely seamless. You do get a bunch of churn, but overall, um, you, you typically in a city like this um, with the wage structure um, uh, relative to the minimum wage hike, you, you, we shouldn't see that much of an overall effect. Martin, we only have about 30 seconds left, but this is not a particularly difficult call for you. What's your prediction for how D.C. voters will go if the $15 minimum wage makes it to the ballot? Oh, I think it would pass, but that's the big thing is if it gets to the ballot. Getting if things on the ballot, the ballot yes. on, on the district is not easy. Many well-intentioned people with good causes have failed before, so there's still a lot of work to be done before voters actually get to vote. They have this. to collect thousands of signatures. Tens of thousands. This, before this gets on the yeah. ballot. Mar Martin Ostermuel is a reporter and web producer at WAMU. Martin, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Noam Scheiber is a reporter for the New York Times. Noam, thank you for joining us. Sure. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.